Hi everyone, so in today's video I'm going to be doing another line edit with me, which is a series that I haven't made a new episode for in a while. So if you're new here, this is a series where I line edit my old writing and kind of just share what I would do at the current moment in time to tweak the prose. These are of course the edits that I'm making at 7.04pm on the 9th of December 2021, so this could change in the future. So we have a variety of excerpts to edit. There are three Three. The first one is going to be a novel opening, which some of you may be familiar with. This is the first chapter of Feeding Habits, the novel I've been working on since April 2020. And so I thought it'd be fun just to kind of look at something that was a bit more polished. Then we have an excerpt right here, which is from Rewired, which is, oh geez, I can't remember what book this is. Probably like my 10th novel, I think, that I'd written when I was 16, 17. I must have been about 17 when I wrote this excerpt. And then this is a final excerpt, which is the most recent. This is actually some writing from Seventh Virtue, which I wrote maybe a month and a half or two months ago. Let's take a look at the first excerpt, which is of course an excerpt from chapter one of Feeding Habits, which is called Bad Vegetarian. There are no rules. Just remember, Eliza is vegetarian. She's into earth tones, neutral tones, leafy greens, root vegetables. It's all new. The day she announced her diet change, she also announced a desire to repaint the kitchen, to fit the new aura, to fit the new ethics. But she wants to paint the kitchen blood red and Lonan is still a meat eater. He reminds himself there are no rules, just remember Eliza is vegetarian. In the hardware store, he thumbs paint chips. They're set up in an array, almost like checkers, dissolving in a gradient from reds to purples. Eliza wants red, not necessarily earthy, but the root of organism, of life, so Lonan looks at the blues. They're all a variant of a seaside theme. Sea breeze, a cloud-like blue, beach umbrella, a wispy aqua, sea foam serenade, muted, like the soft side of a turquoise. Repainting the kitchen matters little to him, and so do the blues, but the red section, devilish, makes him shuffle his blue tech faster. Radio from the store's intercom tins through the speakers, dampened by the hustle of carts, the thud of bodies against the concrete flooring. He holds many chips up to the light, colors he's glumly stirred when he works behind the paint counter part-time, secret getaway in Parisian summer almost the exact shade, but still he flicks through until half the pile is indistinguishable, and the other half are blues he likes and not reds, like Eliza's asked. So that is the excerpt. Um, it is relatively clean. I would make some changes, but I wrote this, if you were wondering, when I was no, oh, geez, how old was I? Well, the pandemic has made it impossible to know my current age. I think I was 18. Sentence by sentence, there are no rules, just remember Eliza is vegetarian. This is fine. I like it. You know, the point of view was a bit of a concern when I was writing this chapter because I thought, oh man, this is the first sentence that popped into my head, but it seems like it's in like maybe almost like a second person. The point of view of feeding habits is a very limited, extremely close third person, which I made an entire video about, if you'd like to check out how I've done that in this book. With that said, though, I was like, does it seem like a bit of like a point of view shift? And then I realized I don't care. You know, there are no rules. <laughs> Just remember, I can write what I want. So I'm not going to change that. She's into earth tones, neutral tones, leafy greens, root vegetables. I like this. I think it's funny. I could say specific leafy greens, like kale, whatever. But I think for the second sentence, being a little bit more general, while still specific, this is neutral tones, leafy greens, root vegetables. These are details that I call vague specific details or kind of more broad specific details. So they are specific. Like it's leafy greens, not just greens. And it's root vegetables, not just vegetables, but it's not particularly naming a root vegetable. It's not naming a leafy green. And I think that works for an opening. You wouldn't want to bombard a reader, at least not in this case, for the voice um, with a whole bunch of details. It's all new is the next sentence. And I really like this addition. I feel like I'm hyping up my writing too much, but we'll get to some edits. But these three sentences, these are fine. The day she announced her diet change, she also announced a desire to repaint the kitchen to fit the new aura, to fit the new ethics. I almost want to say the apartment's kitchen? I don't know, maybe maybe you don't need this, but I'm like, what kitchen? We're just gonna put that there for now. To fit the new aura, to fit the new ethics. I don't like the here, because I don't know why I said the. I would say her, new aura, to fit her. New ethics. This is a weird sentence now I'm realizing. How have I only now noticed that paint and paint is repeated? Oh geez, I don't know how to fix this. I could say, but she also announced a desire to repaint the uh, apartment's kitchen blood red to fit her new aura, to fit her new ethics, but Lonan is still a meat eater. I don't really like 
the flow of that. That's kind of a tricky one to edit. Or I could say their kitchen, their kitchen, then it would be less wordy, but still kind of give us a sense of whose kitchen this is. Blood red. Red, oh my God, not red as in <laughs> read a book. We could do that. I mean, I don't know if I like it. I'd have never noticed that there was a repetition there and I have shared that paragraph like 20,000 times on the internet. Anyway, in the hardware store, he thumbs paint chips. That's fine. They're set up in an array, almost like checkers, dissolving ingredients from reds to purples. So it would be almost like a checkered board. I don't really need this. Like that, dissolving in a gradient from reds to purples. This is a pretty passive sentence. They are set up, they are set up. Dissolving is a bit of a passive way. But we're just gonna leave it like that for now. Solonin looks at the blues, which I think is kind of a funny subversion of what she wants. They're all a variant of a seaside theme. They are all seaside themed. Sea breeze, a cloud-like blue, beach umbrella, a wispy aqua. I like that, that's cute. Cloud-like blue. That doesn't make any sense. How are how are clouds blue, Rachel? I don't know. A cloud-like blue. I it makes sense, but also it makes no sense, you know? A sky blue? Like I know sky blue is a little bit it's more accurate, but it is a bit kind of blah. I'm gonna pull up word book, which is my favorite thesaurus, and we can check out if they have something for sky blue. Blue. Oh they don't. Okay. Well they'll definitely have something for blue. Unstable is the word. That's so funny. I didn't realize what word I'd last looked up. Of course it's unstable because I was writing feeding habits and I was writing about Lonin. So what I like to do is I either go in links, which will give me some pretty specific, the color blue, like here, more specific. These are some specific shades. A sky blue, powder blue, love that. So something that I'm gonna do is just actually Google powder blue to see that that's accurate to what I'm thinking of in my head. And it's literally exactly the shade that I was thinking of. See, what the heck is a cloud-like blue, Rachel? The word is powder blue. And I, I personally like, the reason why I didn't just say blue is because powder blue is more specific, but the word powder has a beautiful sound to it. So when I'm editing, I usually also look for musicality. So I could just say a sky blue. I could just say a blue, but it's just like, that's not specific enough. A powder blue, powder has that double syllable. You're doing something with the, the, the music theory, creating a bit of a rhythmic bump powder because it's double syllables. Instead of just blue, you get two syllables, which is quite nice. And I really like the, the D sound there. It's a very soft, kind of a thudding sound, which grounds the detail of that sentence. Yeah, can you tell that I'm a poet? Seafoam serenade muted like the soft side of a turquoise. I've always not liked this description, despite liking how it looks and sounds. It doesn't make sense. A muted turquoise. It would be a muted, like not the soft side. What is like, let me look at a turquoise. What is the soft side of a turquoise, Rachel? This is what I asked myself when I, when I wrote it and I knew there was no answer, but I was just like, it sounds good. I can't complain. All sides of a turquoise are soft, like unless you get one of these bumpy ones, right? But if you're getting polished turquoise and not like kind of like this raw stuff here, which is ugh, kind of gross to look at, it's going to be soft. So it doesn't make any sense, which means I need to fix it. Like a muted turquoise. We'll just say a muted turquoise. There we go. Makes so much more sense. And then you remove this unnecessary, the soft side of, get rid of those extra words. Repainting the kitchen matters little to him and so do the blues, but the red section, devilish, makes him shuffle his blue tech faster. How come these sentences are only now starting to not make any sense to me? Do I need this? I don't need this. I'm just gonna delete it. So the reason why I'm deleting this sentence is clearly he doesn't care about repainting the kitchen because we've already shown that detail here. So he doesn't care about re uh, repainting the kitchen, but he's looking at the blues. He's not even looking at the paint colors his girlfriend wants. So why would he care about? So we don't need to be told that. And the red section is kind of intrinsically kind of devilish, which you'll get with the religious imagery that comes in later in the chapter. So we don't really need that here. It makes him shuffle his blue deck faster. I don't really understand what this has to do with the red section. Like, is he shuffling it faster because he's scared of the red section? But wouldn't that be counterintuitive? So anyway, we're just deleting that sentence. Radio from the store's intercom tins through the speakers, dampened by the hustle of carts, the thud of bodies against concrete flooring. So number one, this verb has got to go. I, I don't, I don't hate it. 
Oh god, maybe now I'm regretting it. Tins through the speakers. I always flip-flop on verbs because verbs can be a very tricky thing. Um, you can kind of do too much with a verb. A, a verb that's too strong can distract from your um, overall image, the image that you're actually writing about. Uh, on the other hand, it can give a very visceral idea of what's going on in a scene. I almost think tins might be a bit too, too much for this this paragraph. So I'm going to look up echoes because obviously that's in the chain of what I was trying to say. Like I was trying to say that it sounds echoey because it sounds tinny. I could say tinny radio from the store's intercom. But like if I'm saying from the store's intercom, you're going to know it's tinny. So I don't know if we necessarily need that blares. Like is it loud too? Well, no, but it's dampened by the hustle of carts. Oh, but now do I not like it? Oh, I'm just going to bold it. I don't know. I don't know. We'll come back to that. Dampened by the hustle of carts. The thud of bodies against concrete flooring. Anytime you can kind of cut an ING that won't kind of mess up the flow of your sentence, I recommend removing it because ING sounds are quite soft, right? So when you end off on flooring, you're not ending off on a very strong, like, consonantal sound. You're ending off on ING. So I think one of my poetry professors had said something about this of, you know, the end of the sound of language is, is, is it's pretty important in the reading experience. So floor, like that's a closed um, sound, floor. Ing is kind of a ringing sound, which is kind of funny because that's an ing verb ringing. It almost continues to be heard long after the word has been said instead of closing the sentence. Concrete floor is stronger than the thought of bodies against the concrete floor ing in terms of sound. He holds many chips up to the light, colors he's glumly stirred when he works behind the paint counter part-time. They are all... I don't know if we need like the the details here. So he holds many chips up to the light. We don't need many here. He holds chips up to the light, colors he's glumly stirred. I don't know, when he works behind the paint counter part-time. I guess that's okay. I think the word wordiness is a little bit, it's a bit much here, but that's okay. They are all almost the exact shade, but still he flicks through. I like that better than giving the details because if you just say secret getaway in Parisian summer, almost the exact shade, but still he flicks through. Like, I don't know, it is adding too much specificity where um, I think what the writer here, which is me, is trying to get across here is that Monin is just so intently looking at blue colors that are the exact same because he really doesn't want to look through the reds because he, he, he doesn't really understand his, his girlfriend's choice. So he's like, let me just not engage. They are all almost the exact shade, but still he flicks through until half the pile is indistinguishable. What pile? Is he holding a pile? Where, where are the chimps? Because <laughs> at first they were set up in an array. Okay, so I think he's, you know, in, in Home Depot, they'll be on the wall. That makes sense. Lonan looks at the blues. Yeah, so why are they in a pile? <laughs> what is he doing? Now I'm confused about his action. He holds, I think he's selecting them and holding them in his hand, which is why there's a pile. But that's not super clear to me. <laughs> his selection, this is kind of vague, but it is, it makes more, like it's a little bit more specific than pile because you're saying that he, he picked these up, kind of. Half his picks, I could even say, half his selection is indistinguishable and the other half are blues he likes and not reds. Blues he likes, but aren't they indistinguishable? What? I'm so confused. Do we need this thing about Eliza? Because clearly, obviously, why would we need to say they're not reds when obviously we know that they're not reds because they're blues? I'm just going to cut that out. There we go. I think it's obvious that he's, it's not reds. He's clearly holding blues that he likes because he's not looking at the reds. <laughs> so we're just gonna delete it. So uh, the final product sort of first pass is, oh, I didn't figure out tins. Do I want tins? Radio from the store's intercom, tins. Is, you know what? I'm gonna leave that in your hands. Do you like tins or do you not like tins? Um, vote in the comments. There are no rules. Just remember, Eliza is vegetarian. She's into earth tones, neutral tones, leafy greens, root vegetables. It's all new. The day she announced her diet change, she also announced a desire to repaint their kitchen blood red to fit her new aura, to fit her new ethics. Their kitchen. Now I don't really like that their kitchen thing. To repaint the kitchen. Ugh, I don't know. She also announced desire to repaint... Am I just going to go back? The apartment's kitchen. We'll just go back to that. She also she also announced a desire to repaint the apartment's kitchen blood red to fit her new aura, to fit her new ethics. But Lonan is still a meat eater. I don't love this, 
but we'll have to fix it later. He reminds himself there are no rules, just remember Eliza is vegetarian. In the hardware store, he thumbs paint chips. They're set up in an array, dissolving in a gradient from reds to purples. Eliza wants red, not necessarily earthy, but the root of an organism of life. Solon and looks at the blues. They're all seaside themed. Sea breeze, a powder blue, beach umbrella, wispy aqua, sea foam, serenade, a muted turquoise. Radio from the store's intercom tins through the speakers, dampened by the hustle of carts, the thud of bodies against a concrete floor. This is like a fragment. I don't mind it in this sentence. I, I do think that the details work here. Some people don't like fragments at all though, so that's something that you might edit yourself. He holds chips up to the light, colors he's glumly stirred when he works behind the paint counter part-time. I, I feel like he's gl glumly stirred at part-time shifts behind the count. I don't know. I bet I don't. I'm just gonna. He's glumly stirred. We're just gonna leave it this way. They are all almost the exact shade, but still he flicks through until half his selection is indistinguishable. So that's the, that's the, that's the excerpt. You can read the full thing if you would like to. <laughs> so this is the next excerpt. I will zoom out for people who just want to pause to read it, but I will read it out myself as well. The market isn't crowded. Peach stands, a fine brewery, the cigar shop run by the old man. Vendors selling exotic fruits and pickled peppers arranged like toddlers at a school production. It smells like mill and honey. Ooh. <laughs> Darren takes us to make Lone and Less depressed. Anna and her son sample cider from the bakery, and Darren and I link arms and look like a real couple. He takes a wicker basket from the young boy handing them out and piles it with apple butters and concord jellies. Lone and keeps to himself. How much are these? I asked the woman at the cigar shop holding out a box of Cuban cigars. Her septum is pierced and a hoop with a ball dangles from between her nostrils, all kaleidoscopic and silver. 60, she says, and Darren pays for them. Milo's never seen the city. He looks both stunned and paralytic. His mother gets him a wafer, and he nimbles on it like it's currency. Anna buys a plastic carton of honeycomb and gasps when it sticks between her teeth. We lunch at the eatery and I get a meatless hamburger even though I'm not vegetarian and Lonan gets the daily bisque even though he doesn't like bisques. Anna pulls on his wrist when we walk around the square and he almost curses at her. She presents him to a fortune teller who reads his palm. The woman's hair juts across her forehead, all ginger plastic and cat whiskers. It's a wig, but Anna asks if that's her natural color. You're gonna be a millionaire, Anna says as the woman scales his hand. And the woman says, you're going to be a millionaire. Lonan calls it bullshit. And Anna gives the woman a five and looks embarrassed. Milo says, you are bullshit, mommy. And we leave the market and go back to the car. What I'm noticing with this piece overall is the, the point of view and kind of the, the psychic distance here. This is very stream of conscious. It's, it's almost completely written in sort of like a narrative summary or half scene kind of way where it's not fully engrossed into a scene. Like here's a great example. Darren and I link arms and look like a real couple. Like we don't actually see this. She's just summarizing this for us. Anna and her son sample cider from the bakery and Darren and I link arms. Like we're not actually immersed in the scene, uh, but simply the narrator who is Reeve is explaining this to us. Yes, these are the same characters. So let's start here. Um, the market isn't crowded. Peach stands, a fine brewery, the cigar shop run by the old man. The first thing that I'm noticing is that the second sentence has nothing to do with the first sentence besides the market. Uh, it also doesn't sound like the market isn't crowded. The market is crowded. Like, it is crowded. Clearly it is. Because it's Peach stands, fine brewery, cigar shop run by the old man, even though a woman sells at the, anyway sorry we were getting, we'll get to that vendors selling exotic fruits pickled peppers like is, there's a, a mill and honey somebody selling honey too cider bakery like it sounds like it's pretty busy so i don't actually think this is an accurate sentence so a lot of times i noticed when i was younger and first sort of really developing my style and this was a great paragraph to exemplify my developing style i would first start with a sentence that just got me into the scene kind of like a little gateway sentence and the follow-up sentence would be actually what I wanted to write, but I just didn't know how to like start the scene without having like a little filler sentence first. So I'm gonna do something that's pretty like Eliza Robertson y. Let me turn on track changes. And it's a you know, it's 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 a bit more stylized, but tell me what you guys think about this. In the market. Like this. We'll just do this. In the market. Peach stands, a fine brewery, cigar shop. We don't need to know that an old man sells that selling exotic fruits, but like what kind of exotic fruits? Yeah, let's just do like mangosteens, Concord grapes, very different fruits, or maybe not the grapes because we already have an and mangosteens. So it's a bit of like a, we're starting with a, a fragment. It's a sentence fragment, but it is a bit more of a, a stylized one where you have like the colon here. So in the market, 
this is what's in it. Peach stands, a fine brewery. I guess this is, you would probably see this more in um, screenplays. Screen Screenwriters sometimes do this. In the market, peach stands, a fine brewery, a cigar shop, vendors selling mangoes, mangosteens and pickled peppers. I like this detail here, arranged like toddlers at a school production, but it comes at a strange point in the in the paragraph why would we know that like after almost like arranged like toddlers at a school production this is back when i was a bit more like writing more emma Kleiny. it was a bit more of like an airier style which if you have read the girls at least this is more uh, emma's style in the girls it was a bit more written like this we could do vendors are arranged I could say vendors arranged like toddlers at a school production selling mango steens and pickled peppers. We're just gonna leave it like that, even though the details are kind of a little random. In the market, peach stands, a fine brewery. <laughs> okay, we could also do this. Okay, there are many different options. We're gonna go with this. Vendor, in the market, vendors arranged like toddlers. Toddlers at a school production. Sorry that this is, this is, this is messy. You know, we like to just test things. Um, peach stands, cigar shop. I think that works. Fruit stand. A fruit stand that sells, I don't know. With a sale on mango steens and pickled peppers? Maybe, I mean, pickled peppers aren't fruits, but we're just gonna move on. Um, I was just trying to change the sentence structure a little bit, but I mean, the original isn't isn't bad either. We can look at the original. Market isn't crowded, peach stands, a fine brewery, the cigar shop run by the old man. Vendors selling exotic fruits and pickled peppers arranged like toddlers at a school production. It smells like mill and honey. It's not too bad. Um, but this is kind of our markup. In the market, vendors arranged like toddlers at a school production. Peach stands, a fine brewery, a cigar shop, a fruit stand with a sale on mangosteens and pickled peppers. Eh, it works. Both work. It smells like mill and honey. I like this, but what, what does this sound like? What does that mean, mill? Sounds like, I don't know. I was smarter back then, I guess factory i was thinking maybe i was talking about like uh, what is a plant consisting of one or more buildings what would mill sound like grain is that what i me meant like because like, i see mill grain here i don't really understand what i don't think mill because if we're looking at a noun the act of grinding to a powder or dust so does it smell like milled grains it smells like mill and honey grain and honey i could say i kind of like mill i don't know what do you think it's a little abstract because you kind of have to work quite a bit to understand what i'm saying i could just say milk it smells like milled grain and honey i mean sure we'll just do that darren takes us to make alone and less depressed that's kind of funny i go to markets when i'm feeling sad and it does make me feel better. Darren takes us to make alone and less depressed. I'm just kind of wondering if this sentence works. I, I like that because this is like the first sentence, you know, besides this one, that is arranged kind of like a typical sentence. So it kind of brings us back to reality. If we have a, like a more of a abstract kind of start in the market, vendors arrange like toddlers at a school production, right? Peach stands, a fine brewery, a cigar shop, a fruit stand with a sale on mango steens and pickled peppers, right? It smells like milled grain and honey. This here is a bit more painterly. It's a little bit abstract. It's kind of fun to read. Um, it smells like milled grain and honey is um, giving us a little bit more of a dip into reality. And then by the time we get here, Darren takes us to make alone and less depressed is, is back into reality. So I like the placement. Anna and her son, Darren takes us, I guess like us, we would know from context that it's Anna and her son as well. And Darren and I link arms to look like a real couple. I don't really like the repetition of Darren's name here, but... <laughs> and then here, accepts. Darren and I link arms to look like a real couple. He accepts a wicker basket from the young boy from... Boy, we, if we're saying boy, we might be implying that he's younger. It smells like milled grain and honey. Darren takes us to make lone and less depressed. Anna and her son sample cider from the bakery. And Darren and I look arms to look like a real couple. He accepts a wicker basket from the boy handing them out piles it with apple butter and concord jellies alone and keeps to himself this isn't super bad okay we'll leave it like that how much are these i asked the woman at the cigar shop 
Yeah, that makes sense now that it's not an old man. I don't really know anything about cigars, so I don't really know. I don't think that they're legal, so <laughs> I kind of feel weird giving a specific one if I don't know much about them. Cigars. I don't know. Cigars. We'll just free and say cigars. Whatever. I don't know. Cigars. Um, up to the cashier at the cigar shop. Whatever. There's a repetition at the cigar, but I don't know anything about cigars. So <laughs> this is passive voice. Her septum is pierced. Uh, what I would just say is a hoop with a ball dangles from her septum. That makes so much more sense. Instead of doing the is constriction, like her septum is pierced. A hoop of the ball dangles from her septum. Between her not, like why did I repeat myself there? Her septum, all kaleidoscopic and silver. We're gonna delete that because it doesn't make sense. What does that mean? All kaleidoscopic, how is it kaleidoscopic and silver? And also how is that kind of jewelry? Because you're talking about like maybe a horseshoe, like jewelry thing. I wear those all the time, like in my ears. I don't know how you'd get a kaleidoscope in those. 60, she says, this is formatted wrong. One thing I would recommend to you, learn how to format dialogue. I only figured that out this year and I'm in my third year of university. I thought I had it down pat and there was actually one thing that I didn't realize that I was doing wrong when it came to formatting dialogue. So 60, she says, and Darren pays for them. Okay, it works. Milo's never seen the city. How did we jump back to Milo? Milo, where did you come from? <laughs> stunned and parallel you can't this is the same thing and i don't really like that description i don't think that it's good i don't know if i hate like that like milo just jumps right off of this sentence i don't know if it doesn't work darren pays for them if you can hear a loud sniffing it's because my bulldog is outside of my door trying to get into my room <laughs> so i don't know it's like i i feel like we should say outside the shop milo and anna sit on a park bench not like, like not a bench park bench because they're not on a park but on a, an iron bench he's never seen the city we don't need this description i just think that it's too much telling and it's not really it's not necessary i don't really like it either um his mother buys him a wafer from where from gift shop like i don't know where sells wafers I don't know. We'll just say gift shop. And, and he nibbles on it like it's currency. I, I remember I loved this description. He nibbles on it like it's currency. He is eating it like it's precious. I don't think it makes sense now. I, I loved this for many, many years after I wrote it. And I don't like it now. I don't think it makes much sense. And he nibbles on it like it's currency. I'm going to leave it this way just because I think 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old Rachel would kill me if I deleted it. Anna buys a plastic curtain of honeycomb. His mother buys him... Okay, so she's bought two things. Okay, we'll just fix the middle first here. Picks up a glop with her thumb and gasps when it sticks between her teeth. The reason why I added this is because it just, she she buys honeycomb and then she gasps when it stuck, sticks between her teeth. So did the plastic carton of honeycomb stick between her teeth? Obviously it didn't. So we just needed an action of what she did and what actually happened for something to stick between her teeth. But Crane's his neck up at a high rise in the distance and tries to count how many windows are on one side. Um. I just added this because I thought it would be interesting to see him interact with the city because then why do we have that sentence? But, you know, we'll see if it is good enough. This book is already printed. Like, it's never gonna change anyway. So we're just messing with it. Okay, this is what we do. He nibbles on a wafer and a bot from a gift shop. And he nibbles on it like it's currency next to him. His mother, which is kind of, I don't really like describing because we just mentioned Anna. I don't really want to describe it as his mother, but whatever. His mother pulls out a plastic carton of honeycomb she bought. There we go. Picks up a glop with her thumb and gasps when it sticks between her teeth. I really like this reaction. I think that's really interesting. Um, I think it's saying a lot about these two characters who maybe haven't got gone out that, that much in the world, which is actually accurate to what had happened to them. They were kind of just holed up um, in a rural area for a really long time. Um, we lunch at the eatery, not get. Get is kind of like an ugly word, IMO. And I order a meatless hamburger, even though I'm not vegetarian. We'll delete this comma. Lonin orders 
the, the daily bisque, even though he doesn't like bisques. That's kind of funny. Anna pulls on his wrist when we walk around the square after Anna pulls on his wrist. So, so I'm just, I'm still going to retain the kind of vignette uh, stream of conscious vibe. I'm not going to delete it, but I definitely wanted to add some time markers because like, how is he eating a bisque and then walking around the square, right? So just a little time tag right here after Anna pulls on his wrist when we walk around the square. He almost curses at her. Interesting reaction. She presents him to a fortune teller by the exit, maybe? Like, I'm just trying to situate the reader who reads his palm. The woman's hair juts across her forehead, all ginger plastic. That doesn't make sense. And cat whiskers? The woman's ginger hair <laughs> juts across her forehead. It's a wig, but Anna asks if that's her natural color. I really like this line. Uh, you're going to be a millionaire. Anna says to Lonin, right? As the woman scales his hand. And the woman says, you're going to be a millionaire. We're going to make this dialogue. Because everything else is dialogue. You are bullshit, mommy. And we leave the market. In the market, vendors arrange like toddlers at a school production. Peach stands, a fine brewery, a cigar shop, a fruit stand with a sale on mangosteens and pickled peppers. I still don't really like this, but that's okay. It smells like milled grain and honey. Darren takes us to make alone and less depressed. Anna and her son sample cider from the bakery. And Darren and I link arms to look like a real couple. He accepts a wicker basket from the boy handing them out and piles it with apple butters and concord jellies, which is super on brand for Darren. Lonan keeps to himself. How much are these? I hold a box of cigars up to the cashier at the cigar shop. A hoop with a ball dangles from her septum. 60, she says, and Darren pays for them. Outside the shop, Milo and Anna sit on an iron bench. He's never seen the city, cranes his neck up at a high rise in the distance and tries to count how many windows are on one side. Oh, shoot. I realize I messed this up. He nibbles on a wafer. Um, like it's currency. Here we go. I just didn't delete the other part. He nibbles on a wafer and a bot from a gift shop like it's currency. Next to him, his mother pulls out a plastic carton of honeycomb she bought. Next to him, his mother pulls out a plastic carton of honeycomb she bought, picks up a glop with her thumb and gasps when it sticks between her teeth. We lunch at the eatery and I order a meatless hamburger even though I'm not vegetarian. Lonan orders the daily bisque even though he doesn't like bisques. After Anna pulls on his wrist when we walk around the square and he almost curses at her, she presents him to a fortune teller by the exit who reads his palm. The woman's ginger hair juts across her forehead. It's a wig, but Anna asks if that's her natural color. You're going to be a millionaire, Anna says to Lonan as the woman kills his hand and the woman says, you're going to be a millionaire. Lonan calls it bullshit and Anna gives the woman a five and looks embarrassed. Milo says, you are bullshit mommy and we leave the market and go back to the car. I like that. I think that's fun. That's so interesting. I don't write like this at all anymore. I think it's cool though. Um, this is almost like flash fiction in itself. If we had a little bit more um, context, I could actually make this flash fiction. I think it's very interesting. The reactions of the characters are um, quite strong. So just a quick kind of content warning for the next excerpt. There is sort of like an indication of abuse. This is just a little excerpt from Seventh Virtue. Seventh Virtue is in Harrison's point of view, though I am in the process of adding points of view, but this is like one of the scenes that is written in Reeve's head. So I thought it would be fun to have another excerpt in her head, see if the voice is accurate from the previous excerpt, which was also in her head. So I wrote this pretty recently, so don't drag me. <laughs> so what's interesting about this is obviously it's a different genre. So the last two excerpts have been literary fiction. Um, feeding Habits is a bit, yeah, Feeding Habits is literary fiction, I guess. Here, this is genre fiction, right? This is fantasy. So um, let's see if the style changes. Um, as the bathwater fogged Reeves' small bathroom, she unscrewed the bottle of lavender and dropped five drops onto the surface. Then she lined the three crystals down the length of the tub and let the water move them to their final resting places. Her mother had taught her this ritual. The first time they'd practiced it together, Izzy, who was gifted with the ability to predict, held her daughter's wrists so tight the nails carved crescent moons into her young skin. Reeve must have been eight, maybe nine. Together they focused on the patterns the jotting water made. Each time Reeve identified a shape, she voiced it aloud immediately. Any moment later, and Izzy would squeeze her wrist. Sunray, she'd said, when the water danced into a long pentagon. Rosebud, she'd said, a moment after the ripples had already turned into a fig. Her mother squeezed. As Reeve watched the water flood over the crystals, she didn't call out the shapes. She decided long ago this part of the ritual was too strongly associated with evil. When the water nearly reached the lip of the tub, Reeve turned off the faucet. Steam had frosted the mirror which she was grateful for, but the faint wisp of her reflection still bled through. When Wanda, or anyone for that matter, came over, she'd quickly yank down the velvet covering that blocked the mirror most of the time. 
Reeve's reflection disturbed her, and she preferred not to be disturbed. Quickly, she gathered it from underneath the sink and looped it around the pushpins she'd nestled into the drywall above the mirror. So this is the first draft. I didn't edit this. I have not edited this before. So this came directly from my brain. So let's get started on tearing it apart. <laughs> um, so as the bathwater fogged Reeve's small bathroom, she unscrewed the bottle, I would say a bottle. Um, ooh, we're not in track changes. Here we go. A bottle of lavender and dropped five drops onto the surface. <laughs> no, uh, dropped, I think we're gonna find a synonym for that because dropped five drops sounds a little funny to me. Dropped, okay, it doesn't have drop, but it might have drop. Dripped, pearled, oh, you know, you're tempting me with pearl. that verb is a fun verb. I'll just do dripped three drops. It's a little bit clunky to me because of the sound, but some people might not hate it. And I don't know. I don't know if I don't like it. Then she lined the cri th three crystals down the length of the tub. So um, before then, there is a whole explanation on this, which is why I'm not going to specify it. But, you know, if this was a, a standalone piece, I'd have to say, what are these three crystals? You know, what are they? Uh, how big are they? What do they look like? Stuff like that. And let the water move them to their final resting places. I think that this doesn't make sense. So she puts the crystals down and then the water moves them to where they're supposed to end up. Um, and so letting them kind of move is an important part instead of putting them in like a certain place uh, for the ritual. But what's interesting is the bath water has fogged her bathroom. Um, so she's lining the crystals down the length of the tub while water is still running. I guess that's okay. She lined crystals down, let the running water, we'll just say running water move them to their final resting places. I This is a little bit, I don't know, melodramatic to me, their final resting places, but I guess it's part of the ritual, so we'll just move on. <laughs> her mother had taught her this ritual the first time they'd practiced it together. Izzy, who is gifted with the ability to predict, held her daughters was so hard. So, t so tight. I, I'm so bad at this. Somebody who's better at grammar than me, in, in a example like this where there's a comma i'm not sure if it should be that i'm gonna make it a that because um i'm realizing that that might be more correct but maybe i'm wrong izzy was gifted the ability to predict held her daughter's wrist so tight that her nails carved crescent moons to hear her young skin reeve must have been eight maybe nine together they focused on the patterns the jotting water made the jotting water made okay is the water still on i guess it's fine yeah each time reeve identified a shape she voiced it aloud immediately. Any moment later, and Izzy would squeeze her wrist. Sun rays, she'd said, when the water... I don't think we need this in italics. Um, we can just make this dialogue. She'd said, when the water danced into a long pentagon rosebud. Here, we'll just get rid of the past perfect because we don't need it. It's already clear that we're in in a memory, so we're just going to get rid of the past perfect. Oh, I see what I was saying. A moment after the ripples turned into a fig, her mother squeezed. Okay, I see why I have it here. It's because she says it's too late. Rosebud, she'd said a moment too long after the ripples turned into a fig. I don't know. We'll just leave it the way it is. Her mother squeezed as Reeve watched the water flood over the crystals. We're going to put a now just so that we get a, an idea that we're back in kind of the present, even though this memory like of Reeve in the bathroom, this is the fictive present, is in the past. It will make more sense if we make a distinction that um, this past here, which is her remembering her childhood, is not the same as, you know, the past tense of the fictive present. Does that make sense? Now, as Reeve watched the water flood over the crystals, she didn't call it the shapes. She decided long ago, we don't need this. We actually don't need, why don't we just not have, we don't need to be told this. We can kind of infer from the subtext why she wouldn't want it. To, to call out the shapes because clearly this is not a good memory for her with her mother um, being kind of a terrible person um, to her and not being gentle at all. Uh, when the water nearly reached the lip of the tub, Reeve turned off the faucet. Steam had frosted the mirror, which she was grateful for, but the faint wisp of her reflection still bled through. I like these sentences. When the water nearly reached the lip of the tub, I say I could say the tub's lip so we could get rid of the, of the um, which is less, it's less words, right? When Wanda, or anyone for that matter, came over, she'd quickly yank down, we don't need to say quickly here, get rid of the adverb, she'd yank down the velvet covering that blocked the mirror most of the time. Her reflection, we don't need to have her name here. Her reflection disturbed her 
and she preferred not to be disturbed. I kind of like this, even though it's kind of like, obviously, if, if she's doing it, she doesn't want to be disturbed. But I think it, it works for her voice. Down the covering. She gathered. Not gathered. She, like, grabbed the covering or, like, the curtain. I don't know. Down the velvet covering. I'll just say fabric <laughs> from underneath the sink and looped it around the push pins. Um, I don't think we need it to have a dash. She'd nestled into the drywall up of the mirror. I think that's good. Okay, so this was pretty easy. I don't know. I don't think that one needed as much. Um, let's see how it reads now. As a bathwater fogged reads small bathroom, she this is bath bath, but that's okay. As a as the bathwater fogged reads small bathroom, she unscrewed a bottle of lavender. A, a lavender essential oil, we'll just say that. Essential oils, essential oil, and dripped five drops onto the surface. Dripped five drops, that's kind of a funny so sounding phrase. Then she lined three crystals down the length of the tub and let the running water move them to their final resting places. Eh, that's fine. Her mother had taught her this ritual the first time they practiced it together. Izzy, who was gifted with the ability to predict, held her daughter's wrist so tight that her nails carved crescent moons into her young skin. Reeve must have been eight, maybe nine. Together, they focused on the patterns the drowning water made. Each time Reeve identified a shape, she voiced it aloud immediately. Any moment later, and Izzy would squeeze her wrist. Sunray, she said, while the water danced into a long pentagon. Rosebud, she said, a moment after the ripples had already turned into a fig. Her mother squeezed. Now, as Reeve watched the water flood over the crystals, she didn't call it the shapes. When the water nearly reached the tub's lip, Reeve turned off the faucet. Steam had frosted the mirror, which she was grateful for, but the faint wisp of her reflection still bled through. I could also change this to one verb that's not bled through. Still, like, I don't know. We'll just leave it. When Wanda, or anyone for that matter, came over, she'd yank down the velvet covering that blocked the mirror most of the time. Her reflection disturbed her, and she preferred not to be disturbed. She grabbed the fabric from underneath the sink and looped it around the pushpins she'd nestled into the dry wall above the mirror. All right, so that is the end of today's video. Here, we'll just show you all the markup now where we edited all of these excerpts. And I had a lot of fun doing this on some more recent um, work, um, but there is still quite a lot you can do to, you know, recent work. You know, I thought that the opening of Feeding Habits was basically done, but still I made quite a few changes. Then obviously um, this part from Rewired has been shifted quite a lot, which was nice. And then the final for Seven the Virtue, this is the first draft, but I just tweaked it up a little bit and I think it reads a lot cleaner now. So uh, I hope that this video was helpful for you guys. If you have any suggestions for what you want to see in these editing videos, if you want me to cover dialogue or characterization or description, let me know and I will make more because this is super fun. This is what I do all the time because I'm a writing student. I hope that this was helpful for you guys in kind of giving you a sneak peek into how I currently line edit and I will see you in another video. Bye!